Imagine reading these headlines the day after a presidential inauguration. President refuses to take the oath of office on the Bible. Vice President, First Lady absent from the inauguration. Now, as you read the details, you find out the First Lady simply refused to attend her husband's inauguration. As you read even further, you find out the Vice President took the oath of office, just not in Washington, D.C. I think this was probably perhaps one of the saddest inaugurations we ever had, and also one of the most puzzling. I mean, why did the First Lady simply refuse to go to Washington, D.C.? Where was the Vice President? And why did a religious president refuse to take the oath of office on the Bible? Well, we'll answer these questions and take a look at all of the events surrounding the inauguration and their long-lasting impact on the 14th President of the United States in this edition of Prez Politics. It's 1852, Democratic Convention. They vote 49 times until they finally get their compromise candidate. It was a dark horse candidate, a candidate that came out of nowhere. He was from New Hampshire. His name was Franklin Pierce. What's odd is Franklin Pierce had been out of politics for the better part of a decade. If you take a look here at his resume, you see he's got an extensive resume in state politics and national politics. We're told that when Pierce was told of his nomination for president for the Democratic Party, that his wife, Jane, became overwhelmed with emotion that she fainted. Their only child, Benny, later on during the presidential election, wrote his mother and said that he didn't want to go to Washington, D.C. And basically, he knew how she felt. I mean, he did understand his mother. She had been, Jane had been in Washington, D.C. for four miserable years, while Franklin had served in the U.S. House of Representatives. She hated the sights and the sounds, the smells, the crowded boarding houses of Washington, D.C. And on top of that, she suffered from poor health. After years of persuasion, she finally persuaded Franklin to give up politics. He resigned his U.S. Senate seat from New Hampshire there and went back to New Hampshire and practiced law and was a family man. And for the first time in his life, he was there for his family. And Pierce said, in fact, that he never voluntarily wanted to be separated from his family again. Jane was such a positive influence on her husband that she got him to give up drinking, which had been a problem of his for many years. But now, more than ever, family was everything. Given the fact that they had lost two sons within a period of about seven years, one was an infant, and one was four years old. Franklin Pierce beat the Whig candidate, Winfield Scott, in a landslide. 254 electoral votes to 42. January 6, 1853, bitterly cold day. President-elect Pierce, his wife Jane, and Benny are on a train from Andover, Massachusetts, headed home to Concord, New Hampshire. About a mile from the train station, the train derailed, axle broke, sent their car over a hillside into a ravine. Now, President-elect Pierce and his wife Jane were not seriously hurt, but they did find their son, Benny, head crushed, nearly decapitated. Can you imagine the haunting sight for any parents to see the mangled body of their son? And in this case, the Pierce family became overwhelmed with grief. They have three dead children now within a period of 17 years. Well, Jane just simply refused to attend her husband's inauguration. She was in deep mourning and in deep depression. And she really looked at and viewed as, at Benny's death really resulting from Franklin's political ambition. She is deeply religious. She's deeply Calvinistic. She's a, a Congregationalist which is from the old Puritan line. She's trying to make sense of Benny's death in the context of God's permissive will. And she really ends up coming to the conclusion that Benny's death was God's way of removing all distractions, distractions from Franklin here so he could just focus on his presidential duties. Franklin believes that God is punishing him for his political ambition. 
Benny's death is a, a result of that. And so he decides to depart from presidential tradition and be, because he's so upset and he does feel like God is punishing him, he refuses to take the oath of office on the Bible and instead he takes the oath of office on a law book. As you can see from this reference in his inauguration speech, you can see that he's making reference to this personal pain that they're, they're going through at this time. I mean, I think it's very simple. He's saying, no one can really understand the pain that I'm going through. He talks about having personal regret, and I would assume that would be running for president. And he really acknowledges that there's more qualified people to hold this office than himself, uh, which really shows his humility. But he also goes on to say in that speech that you've summoned me in my weakness, you must sustain me by your strength. And a little bit later on, and sometime later, Jane does agree to move to Washington, D.C., and she moves into the White House. She does order that the White House be draped in black crepe uh, to really uh, show that the nation, along with her, would be mourning for Benny's death. And she wore black uh, as a sign of mourning uh, during this time period. They nicknamed her the Shadow of the White House. Jane was not really visibly seen for the better part of two years. She didn't handle the social functions of the White House publicly. And during this time period, she's writing letters to her dead children, uh, many of which just sort of regret, show some of the personal regret that she had. It's Inauguration Day. Where's the Vice President? The Vice President's named William King. He's a Southerner. He's also 19 years older than Pierce. But during the election, he contracted tuberculosis. And so he went down to Cuba, a warmer climate, to re recover. Well, by the time that he found out that they had won the election, he knew that he wouldn't have enough time to get back to Washington, D.C. for the inauguration. And so Congress did something that they've only done one time and they've never done since. They passed special legislation for the vice president to be given the oath of office out of the country. And so Vice President King here took the oath of office while in Cuba. Unfortunately, he did make it, he did make it back to the United States about a, a month later, but unfortunately, after making it home to his home in Alabama, he died a day later. And he's the shortest serving vice president that we've ever had. In fact, no one was selected to replace him as vice president because there was no mechanism in place at the time to replace him. Not until the 25th Amendment comes along later do we have a mechanism in order to replace uh, a, like the vacancy of a vice president. The Democratic Party, in fact, refused to renominate Pierce to be their candidate in the next presidential election. It was the only time a major political party had refused to renominate an incumbent president, that is someone who had gotten elected in his own right. There was no confidence in his ability to get reelected. And as he's leaving office, he reportedly said, there's nothing less left to do but to get drunk. And Franklin and his family returned home, his wife, passed away in 1863 in the middle of the Civil War, and after that, Franklin returned to drinking. And it was just six years later, in 1869, some 13 years after leaving the White House, that he died, and he died from cirrhosis of the liver. We've had a number of U.S. presidents who have suffered personal tragedy in their families. Can you think of another president who suffered the loss of a family member who had a greater impact on their presidency than Franklin Pierce? I'd be interested in knowing what you think. Put your opinions and your comments in the sections below. Hey, if you liked our video today, give us a thumbs up. If you haven't already subscribed to Press Politics, do that right now.